In order for the proper regulation of glomerular filtration, there's two primary mechanisms that play a role here. The first is the myogenic mechanism, which we of course know that that refers to smooth muscle. And what happens here is that the smooth muscle, it contracts when it's stretched. And this increased blood pressure that's coming into the afferent arteriole, it's going to cause the muscle to stretch, therefore leading to constriction of the afferent arteriole. And what this does is it restricts the blood flow into the glomerulus. And it, therefore, because of that, it protects the glomerulus from damaging high blood pressure. Because that blood pressure should never be over around 55, 60 millimeters of mercury. Otherwise, there could be damage to those cells. And as we discussed in a previous lecture, that is normally already a high blood pressure for a cap, uh, capillary bed. So now this decreased blood pressure, it causes dilation of these afferent arterioles. And this helps to maintain normal GFR, which is the glomerular filtration rate, despite fluctuations in blood pressure. So that's one mechanism. The second mechanism is what's called tubuloglomerular feedback, which sounds like a, a mouthful, but basically it's a feedback loop that's between two parts of the nephron. It's between the renal tubule, which would be the PCT, the loop of Henle, the DCT, as well as the glomerulus. So there's kind of this um, communication between the two that tells the, it's directed by the specialized cells called the macula densa cells. And these macula densa cells are specific, specific chemoreceptors that sense sodium chloride concentration. So therefore, if the GFR increases, if the um, GFR is too high, the filtration rate increases and it leads to decreased reabsorption time. So the philosophy of this is it causes high salt levels in the filtrate and it allows for more salt to be reabsorbed as it should be. So it's an opposite mechanism for decreased glomerular filtration rate. So both of these are equally important. Now, they can be controlled a couple different mechanisms. They can be controlled via the um, extrinsic controls, which we know is outside of the kidney. And those intrinsic controls control, they utilize both nerves and they involve both hormones. And in this case, the purpose is to regulate the GFR to maintain the systemic blood pressure as needed. And the extrinsic controls are always going to override the intrinsic controls. Intrinsic controls being the controls that are within the kidney. So it kind of trumps if you will, the intrinsic controls takes over. So if there's severe blood pressure drop in the body, if the body's going into hypovolumic shock, for example, then the extrinsic controls are going to play a role. So the way that this happens is primarily via the sympathetic nervous system. Remember that's your fight or flight nervous system. And in this fight or flight nervous system, the renal blood vessels are going to dilate. The renal autoregulation is going to prevail. So it's an auto regulation that automatically occurs. The norepinephrine is released by the sympathetic nervous system and epinephrine, the two catecholamines that you've learned about. And that's going to cause systemic vasoconstriction. It'll cause vasodilation at the afferent arteriole, 
but vasoconstriction all throughout the body. So um, this is going to decrease the GFR and blood volume and blood pressure increase, again, via the systemic nervous system. So this is the neural mechanism. The hormonal mechanism is what's called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and it has these uh it has several words because it involves three different chemicals basically renin is going to uh, be released by the kidney itself angiotensin is a vasoconstrictor and then aldosterone is responsible for sodium reabsorption specifically primarily in the ascending limb and of the um, loop of Henle and also the distal uh, tubule, the distal convoluted tubule. So the pathways by which this happens is renin is released by those granular cells that you learned about in the juxtaglomerular complex. And this direct stimulation of, is going to be by cells or by the sympathetic nervous system and is stimulated by activated macula densa cells when the filtrate of salt sodium chloride is low. So other factors include adenosine. Adenosine is a vasodilator and then also pro prostaglandin E2. The E2 part is an important as long as you know that it's prostaglandin. And then other factors that affect this include um, Basically, whenever there's a drop in blood pressure, this is going to trigger the release of renin, as we would expect. So our next slide is going to kind of summarize this in a graphical format. So we can see, um, first of all, on the, our main stimulus is that there is a mass drop in blood pressure. So this is probably going to require a, an extrinsic effect. The drop in blood pressure in the afferent arterioles is going to lead to a drop in GFR. So that GFR, glomerular filtration rate, has to be raised. It decreases the stretch of the smooth muscles of the afferent arterioles, leading to vasodilation of the afferent arterioles, essentially allowing more fluid to go into that glomerulus. Because as we know by now, the more fluid there is, the higher the blood pressure is, a lesson that you learned well back in the cardiovascular system. So the decrease in GFR, another factor, another mechanism that happens here, which were summarized on the previous slide, leads to the activation of the macula densa cells and vasodilation of afferent arterioles. Again, the same End result, it's just that it's referred to as the tubuloglomerular mechanism, whereas the one that deals with smooth muscles is the myogenic mechanism. Over here on the right-hand side of this diagram, we see granular cells as well. And you should know that granular cells are responsible for releasing renin. And as you know, the renin leads to angiotensin II release which is vasoconstriction and aldosterone release. And again, the function of aldosterone is reabsorption of sodium by the kidney tubules. So the net result of both of these mechanisms is to increase blood volume, which corresponds to increase in blood pressure. And then the last one is uh, more of a very quick mechanism. It involves baroreceptors and this inhibits baroreceptors so it involves the sympathetic nervous system and it would be the neural controls so this would be the neural controls and the hormonal controls that are shown here so this slide does a nice job of showing us the intrinsic mechanisms the autoregulation mechanisms as well as the extrinsic mechanisms the ones that are required when there's more mass changes in blood pressure that require the entire system to function at this time.
So our next slide is the summary now of the GFR. And just a couple things that I want to point out on this slide specifically are that the intrinsic control, remember, is there's two of them. There's myogenic and there's the tubuloglomerular feedback. For the extrinsic control, it's hormonal, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system here, and the neural system. And as you can see, the neural system is required when there are greater blood pressure changes than the intrinsic control system. So if it's less than 80 millimeters of mercury or greater than 180. If it's between 80 and 180, then it involves just the intrinsic control system. So our next slide is showing a homeostatic imbalance called anuria. Anuria is the abnormally low urinary output, which usually reflect, reflects a problem with the kidney. You should know that that is called anuria. The next slide is on tubular reabsorption. And tubular reabsorption, we talked about before, tubular reabsorption is the reclamation of the tubular contents that return to the blood. So whatever's in the renal tubule is going to be reabsorbed into the paratubular capillaries during this process. And it involves both active and passive processes for this to occur. The tubular reabsorption of specific nutrients, water, and ions. This is going to involve, again, active transport. It's not real important that you know if it's primary active transport or secondary active transport, as long as you know that the large majority of reabsorption is going to happen in the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule. And that includes the reabsorption of glucose, amino acids, some ions and vitamins. So by the time the liquid, the fluid in the renal tubule reaches the descending limb of the loop of Henle, there should not be any more glucose or amino acids that are present. So as we increase the osmotic pressure, we increase the production of ADH and that decreases urine production. So aquaporins are proteins that are inserted in the collecting ducts, but only if ADH is present. So that's what it means by facultative. It's dependent on the hormones specifically. So this slide is showing the passive tubular reabsorption of solutes and the solute concentration and the filtrate increases as the water is reabsorbed. Uh, there's certain chemicals that are reabsorbed which are not necessarily desirable. Um, so lipid soluble drugs are reabsorbed and that we can explain because of the phospholipid bilayer. We know that, that um, fats dissolve fats and so it goes very quickly in. And finally, the transport maximum is an important concept that tells basically how many proteins there are for that specific substance. So if that transport maximum is saturated, everything else is going to be excreted in the urine. So for example, the, tri the transport maximum for um, glucose is about 375. If our blood glucose levels in the plasma is above that, that excess amount is going to be spilled over into the urine in the case of hyperglycemia. And we have a transport maximum for all other potential, um, all other chemicals as well, not just the glucose. 